Our next speaker is uh, Tal Lufa from Aris with a presentation entitled um, Delivering Giganet Speed to the Home, the Next Evolution in Access Architecture. Tal is Director of Product Line Management for CMTS's CCAP products at uh, Product line at Aris Solutions, beg your pardon. In our current role, Teller, uh, Teller is responsible for video feature implementation on E6000 CER and the E6000 product development, deploying as a full CCAP platform. Teller is part of the CMTS CCAP product management team, designing the current and future generations of software and hardware features of the product, according to customer and market evolution requirements. She was a member of the Cable Labs Working Group and has contributed to the CCAP Technical Requirements publication. Tell holds an MBA with ONS as well as a BSc in Electrical Engineering and Computer Science from the Tel Aviv University. Tell, thank you. All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for, uh, for having me here today. What we're going to talk about is the next evolution of access architecture. How can we actually scale up the network for you for cable operators to get to the next level of bandwidth throughput, getting to one gig and above that. So let's jump right in. Hope this one works. Do I have to direct it somewhere so it's going to work? Oh, just going to take a while. All right. So we're in the cable industry after all. We can't start our morning without a bandwidth graph on our screen. So let's just get it over with, right? So this is a graph that we have created according to the ARIS projections of, um, of the spectrum that is going to be required to comply with the market trends and market needs for additional bandwidth. So we're looking into that and we're saying, okay, we still have the broadcast. We still have VOD. We have high-speed data that is still going to go and be there for the next probably 10 years or so. But what we're seeing exploding is the IP consumption in terms of high-speed data, yes, but also more on the IPTV kind of content and different types of applications that are more in the, more in the entertainment um, market. So if we look at it from the home perspective, the next, uh, the next slide is going to show us what are the biggest drivers for, I need to direct it over here, I guess. Huh. there's a keyboard. Um, maybe I'll use that one then. Um, so basically what we're looking at right now is what are the biggest drivers from, uh, from the home perspective. So say this is a home kind of requirement point of view. I took that slide from our CPE team. And we're looking at what is driving the higher bandwidth consumption inside the home. So today we have Netflix, we have streaming, we have HD content that is driving, you know, a few hundred megs of, of data and the worst case to the home. But when we look at the future, we look at additional types of applications and entertainment trends that are driving a much higher bandwidth requirement inside the home. So it's been talked a lot um, recently about this application called Pokemon Go, which is an augmented reality type of application. But this is just the start of it. We're looking into virtual reality types of applications, and those are going to be much more common in the home as we go forward in the next few years. But just imagine that on top of having virtual reality type of applications, those applications can also be HD. Not just virtual reality SD, it can be virtual reality HD. And later on, it can be virtual reality with ultra HD. And we're looking at you know, televisions that are going to go to 8K. All of that is driving a huge bandwidth surge inside the home. And you guys, the operators in the cable industry, need to find creative ways to deliver all that bandwidth. So I promise just one last bandwidth graph before we jump into the uh, technology side. I'm sure you've seen this one before. This is not a new one, but I really like it because it still works. It still works. Um, the Nielsen's law is still very much applicable these days. Every do, every do, even though every year they've been telling us it's been broken, it's been non-relevant anymore, but it still provides a very good, not, very good projection of the bandwidth that the customers, our subscribers in the end, are going to require. So right now today we're at 2016. Um, how do I do that? We're at 2016 um, over here. So we're getting into 100 megs to an average home, getting into one gig probably later this year or next year. 
But we're look, if we're looking a few years down the line, we can see that there's a very nice trend of um, still going up in a kind of a linear way. And at some point in time, we'll be reaching the 10 gig uh, limit and we'll be, let's still work. We'll be reaching the 10 gig limit uh, on the Doxus True Dot 1 spectrum that we have. And what do we do then? At that point in time, we've been at, people are asking us, you know, operators, what do you do then? Are you going to stop using HFC DOCSIS? Do we have to just you know, tear it all out and start building again? Or are we going to have a new type of technology that is going to enable us to keep using the HFC infrastructure that is already built up in the street and will be able to go to an evolutionary path going forward? And of course, we believe that the evolutionary path is preferable and there's still a lot of life left inside the HFC plant. So two options, revolutionary or evolutionary. And we're going to talk about the evolutionary path in this uh, talk today. So when we look at it um, on a high level, the HFC plant has got a lot of life in it. We still have a lot of ways and new types of innovations that I'm going to talk about in this talk today that will allow us to actually provide more bandwidth to the home for all the types of subscribers that we have. Generally speaking, when we talk about green fields, and that's, that's the, one, uh, the one group over here, most operators believe today that for green fields, they should deploy PON. That is true to some extent, and PON eventually, fiber to the home, is going to be possibly the, the end goal of, um, of our industry. But it's going to take a long, long time until we get to that point, until we are actually able to provide that type of architecture, and until we're going to be able to actually deploy this type of architecture, right? It's going to cost a lot of money to dig up all the streets, dig up all the, the gardens and yards of all your customers to get that fiber to every each home. So this is a very big challenge, and the question is, okay, we can't invest millions and billions and trillions of dollars today to do all of that in one go, but we can do that in an evolutionary path, and how do we do that? So my talk today is going to try to address this question. So... As I said, green fields for, uh, are going to be using PON. But, okay, that's green fields. There are some of them, but not that many. Another big chunk of uh, subscriber uh, group is, is going to be the brown fields, the one in the center. Brown fields are those that currently already have an HFC infrastructure. And we do have uh, a way to upgrade their HFC plant. We can also upgrade them to PON. These are two options that are available to us. And this group of subscriber is the group that is requiring a very high bandwidth uh, throughput, you know, even today. Talking about uh, very centralized areas of uh, residence, talking about uh, big uh, office buildings, central, you know, university, per, possibly. All those very dense, um, very dense subscriber groups are very good candidates to think about when we talk on the FTTA, FTTX migration. So they do have HFC today. We may want to move them to PON, but we may want to do that gradually in a way that will allow to provide them with higher bandwidth, even today, right now, because they really need it right now. But we want to do that, again, not dig up all the streets and replace everything, but start migrating them to fiber to the home or fiber to the premises as fast as we can. So we're going to talk about that group of customers in the last part of my talk today. The last group, which is the third one over here, is the biggest one, actually. These are all your existing subscribers, all of your residential areas or, you know, even small businesses, etc. All of your existing subscribers that are using HFC today, they have the infrastructure in place. They are requiring more and more bandwidth. Remember that graph about different types of uh, entertainment applications that are required. And what do we do about those? We can't just dig up all the streets again and replace them all with PON, provide them with the bandwidth that they need. But we do have a lot of very good ways using the up-and-coming innovations on the current HFC plants to be able to provide them with more bandwidth and actually do that in a cost-effective way by providing more bits per hertz on the existing plant without changing much. So for those customers, the challenge would be how do you give them more bandwidth with as little investment as possible, right? Reducing the uh, the capex and opex, we always want to set to spend to, to to save on the spend, 
and without digging too much of the streets and without changing too much of the RF plant because that's going to be the big investment factor, right? So we're going to talk about those customers um, first, th that group of customers first. But before I go and talk about that group of customers, you may ask me, hey, Tal, what are you talking about? Pawn is much better. It's much bigger. It's much bigger pipe. It's a much faster uh, type of uh, bandwidth uh, throughput. How can you even compare them? Well, evidently, I can, and I will. So this is what this graph here wants to show us. So basically, when we talk about PON, PON is, it is a very good tool. It is a very, um, a very nice big pipe of, uh, of, of data. It's a very good transport system. But if we're using some of the newer tools on the HFC infrastructure, we're able to get to similar bandwidth to PON. So this is why I am able to come here and tell you guys, hey, listen, take a look at what we can do on the current HFC plant because we can get to comparative bandwidth on the existing HFC plant that can be comparative and competitive to PON infrastructure, and it may also cost you less. So this is to show you that we can actually take a look at that and try to make use of that and getting to the same levels of, of bandwidth. So let's look at the downstream direction, which is the one over here. Downstream direction is easier. The different uh, candlesticks that you see in this, um, in this slide over here are signifying different types of uh, technologies, DOCSIS 3.1 and DOCSIS 3.0. And uh, the different types of colors are uh, to signify the usage of the spectrum, meaning do you use up to one gig of spectrum on the downstream or up to 1.2? Later on, we can do more than that. But these, these are comparing the different types of, uh, of, of spectrum usage and types of technologies. So if we look at the best one, which is the green one over here, this is the one that is using the full spectrum that is currently defined by the DOCSIS 3.1 spec. So if we use DOCSIS 3.1, current HFC network, we can get to a very close level to PON, uh, to 10 gig EPON performance in, in terms of throughput. So you see this one, this green one over here, is getting to very similar uh, levels of bandwidth as EPON. So on the downstream direction, we see that we can get to comparative uh, kind of bandwidth. On the upstream direction, of course, it's a little bit more of a problem, right? We know that. So on the upstream direction, there's a very high candlestick over here that is the 10 gig EPON on the upstream direction, which is not something we can compete with just yet on the cable industry. But we are working on that. So. If we look at what we can do today on the DOCSIS side, it's still a little bit low. Yeah, it is. Uh, we're looking into having DOCSIS 3.1 on the upstream direction going to 200 megs on the upstream. But this is exactly the problem that full duplex DOCSIS is trying to address. And full duplex DOCSIS was established as a way to upgrade the capability of the cable infrastructure to get to higher bandwidth on the upstream direction. And we're going to talk about that in the next group of slides. So again, this is just to show you that I'm not just talking nonsense, right? There is a reason to compare the EPON to the existing infrastructure, um, H, the, the existing HFC infrastructure and the bandwidth you can actually get with that infrastructure. All right, so how do we capitalize on the existing HFC networks? And let's talk about all the different types of technologies that you can use starting from today and going into the future, so this is in a kind of a gradual way, starting from DOCSIS 3.1 that you can already use today, and going a little bit further into the future to uh, distributed access architectures, uh, full duplex DOCSIS, and extended spectrum DOCSIS. Uh, I'm not going to talk much about DOCSIS 3.1 because we have a full afternoon about that, but I do want to mention a few things just to clarify on why do we think this is such an important stepping stone for the evolution of our industry. So DOCSIS 3.1 is really cool, you know that, it can do a lot of bandwidth, but let's talk about how do you actually deploy that and when can you actually deploy that to get that additional upgrade to your existing plant. So first of all, the main benefit of DOCSIS 3.1 is the use of new type of algorithms to do the forward error correction and to be able to squeeze more bits into the existing spectrum. This is a very important point that I think people are not necessarily, you know, understanding in full. That means that if you just turn on DOCSIS 3.1 on your network today, without touching anything, not changing any amplifier, not extending the spectrum, not touching 
pretty much anything. Just do a software upgrade or possibly a hardware upgrade, depends on, on your vendor, and, and activate Doxus 3.1, you are already able to get more bandwidth on your existing plat that can go to you know 10%, 20%, 30% on the downstream direction, and even more than that on the upstream direction. Yes, you do have to upgrade the CPE devices, which is not a small investment, that's true, but we're not talking about them right now, right? We're talking about the network, stu the network, network stuff. So on the network side, the DOCSIS 3.1 benefit is very real, and it will start when you just upgrade to DOCSIS 3.1, and it will grow and grow and grow as much as you improve your plant, extend your spectrum, and go, go higher in the level of modulations that you actually, actually allow in your network by cleaning it up and providing better conditions for those signals. So this is the key point that I wanted to make on, on DOCSIS 3.1. And if we're looking at those numbers, again, remember the candlesticks that I showed you the last, those numbers that we get with DOCSIS 3.1 are actually comparable to 10 gig EPON on the downstream, 1 gig EPON on the upstream direction. So just DOCSIS 3.1 gets, gets you to, again, a competitive point of view with, with 10 gig EPON downstream. So this is DOCSIS 3.1. Again, not going to go into that too much because you do have a lot of, uh, you do have a lot of uh, content about that later. Uh, if you don't hear me, just tell me, okay? I'll just shout. So the question is, when do you want to move to DOCSIS 3.1? And we do have customers that are already moving to DOCSIS 3.1 today. We have some deployments already uh, with our ARIS equipment. Others have that as well. But we are looking into a, a, a sweet spot for the movement to, the, for the mass movement, for the mass migration to DOCSIS 3.1. And that is not today just yet because those CPE devices are not, you know, generally available just yet. The networks are still not ready. Customers are still trialing the DOCSIS 3.1. They're starting to turn on those DOCSIS 3.1 modems, but they're not deploying them in masses just yet. And the question is, when do you actually have to move to DOCSIS 3.1? Not when you want to do that. Of course, if you, if you have the ability, if you have the resources, do it today. Start doing it today so you can learn much more about your network and start getting ready for that mass deployment. But the point in time in which you actually must move to that DOCSIS 3.1 is going to be a little bit later, around 2019, in some of the projections. So this, this graph shows you the T-max and the T-average uh, that we expect customers to require in the next few years. You can see that the T-max is the one that is obviously requiring the upgrade to the network and driving the bandwidth up. And if we look at it, if we look at it in terms of the DOCSIS 3.0 context, these are the bandwidth that we believe that you can bring to your customers by using just DOCSIS 3.0 uh, cable modems. So if you bond together, you know, 8, 16, 28, 32 DOCSIS 3.0 channels, you're able to get to those levels of bandwidth and you don't actually have to move to DOCSIS 3.1. Again, you may want to move because it will be more efficient for you and you'll be able to do that in higher areas of, you know, in other areas of the spectrum that you are not using today. But you don't have to move because, again, you can use Doctor Street at O up to that point. The breaking point is probably going to be around 2018 and 19, and we're very much geared into starting deploying all that, um, all that equipment already today, but in greater masses in 2018 and 19 to, be, to allow you to grow your network and support the DOCSIS 3.1 bandwidth. So that's DOCSIS 3.1. And again, can't emphasize enough on how much is it a stepping stone to the next type of technologies. Uh, if we're looking into uh, full for full duplex DOCSIS, looking into remote FI that I'm going to talk about next, talking about extended spectrum DOCSIS, all of those are pretty much relying on the ability to migrate to DOCSIS 3.1. Why are they relying on DOCSIS 3.1? Because DOCSIS 3.1 allow us to migrate to higher areas of the spectrum, areas where we were not able to transmit on before. It's more robust in terms of interference and it allows us to provide higher bandwidth in those areas than we were ever able before. Plus, there are some mechanisms inside the DOCSIS 3.1 that enable us to do uh, all the cool stuff that we'll later be able to do with, DOCSIS, uh, with full duplex DOCSIS and extended spectrum. And we're going to talk about that in the next few slides. All right, so let's talk about distributed access architecture. This is also a very uh, hot trend in our industry right now. Everybody's talking should they move, should they not move? 
So this is a very good question that you know, we've been asked very often. Should we move to distributed access architecture and what value does it bring to us? How will it help us get to higher uh, throughput and higher bandwidth to our subscribers? So let's just you know, level straight our, uh, our understanding of what does it mean to do, to do distributed access architecture. So if we're looking into the um, three areas of the network, meaning the, uh, the head end or hub, the network itself, the node, and the home. These are, the, these are going to be, I'm going to show you the three types of access architectures that are currently considered. So let's start from what we have today, which is a centralized access architecture, the integrated CCAP that we have today, where you have all the DOCSIS processing, both Mac and Fi, inside the head end. We have HFC going to the node. We have a fiber node going to the home. Pretty much standard what you guys uh, have today, what most MSOs in the world have today. The next architecture that is coming up is Remote Fi. And Remote Fi means that you're taking the Fi functionality, moving that to the node, to the fiber node, and you're able to keep the Mac processing inside the head end, inside the hub. And use the and use the, those fibers that are already out there to transmit digital signals. And those digital signals are much more efficient naturally than the analog signals that are being used in the integrated CCAP solution over here. So remote fi is the first step into bringing more functionality closer to the subscriber. We're looking at it. Um, we're looking at it here in the remote fi node and it's going to be closer to the subscriber it can be n plus zero it can also be n plus one or n plus two right the node can still have some amplifiers after that but the trend we are seeing right now and the big interest that we're seeing from our customers is saying okay if we're going deep let's go all the way let's go to n plus zero which is also referred to as fiber deep architecture so this is a very uh, common one that is being uh, looked at and we're helping our customers understand how can they get to this type of architecture? The third type of architecture, architecture that is currently being discussed is uh, the remote Mac and Fi. And that means that we're taking the Mac functionality as well, the one that is still left over here in the, Mac, in the remote Fi case, moving that to the, remote, uh, to the remote node and having the ability to keep only routing functionality or you know, edge router, northbound router, a centralized router inside the head end or inside the hub. So that means that you are still using those digital optics over here to transmit the signals down to the remote uh, Mac and Fi. And the both Mac and Fi functionality reside again inside uh, the node closer to the subscriber, can be N plus zero, can be something else as well. And this is uh, to move everything down there. So the benefits of that are, are pretty obvious, I think, from just looking at it, right? You're moving more and more stuff down closer to the subscriber, and you're freeing up a lot of space and power inside the head end. However, some people will tell me, okay, what, do you, what you've done here? You're just taking some functionality, moving it down the line. You're not asking for less power. You're just moving the power somewhere else. That is true, partially. But this power, when it's dispersed this way, is a little bit more effective. And we're able to actually reduce the entire power consumption because we're using a much more evolved and much more efficient components inside our remote Fi uh, nodes and our uh, <coughs> distributed access architecture nodes out there. Um, there are a lot of challenges, challenges around it um, and there are a lot of benefits. The challenges are to move those components out to the node, meaning your technicians that are handling the nodes will now have to handle a much more complex device out there, right? The installation is going to be a little bit more complicated. The maintenance, maintenance is going to be a little bit more complicated. But a lot of benefits as well as this remote Fi and remote Mac and Fi are enabling you to provide higher bandwidth to your customers and also going to higher, uh, to higher bandwidth on the upstream direction using full duplex doxes that we're going to talk about next. So let's look at what value does uh, remote, uh, remote access architecture provide us when we look at term, in terms of the uh, signal to noise ratio. So if we look at it uh, on this graph, we're looking into signal to noise ratio and different types of access uh, topologies, put it this way. So starting from the left side, we're, uh, we're starting from 80 kilometer distance between the centralized head end or hub to the node, meaning you have 80 kilometers between 
your Mac core and your remote Phi node or between your router on the uh, your router inside the head end and the actual remote Mac and Phi node uh, closer to the home. As we go down the line on the axis of this graph, we're getting closer, we're getting to closer, uh, to closer ranges and to shorter distances between the head end and the node. And that means that it's becoming, of course, more efficient, right? You can see that the signal to noise ratio is climbing as we get to shorter distances between the head end and the nodes themselves. Now that's obvious, right? That's not, not telling you anything new here. However, when we look at it in terms of CNR, we put, we put some numbers over here to show you what the CNR actually means to you in terms of bandwidth uh, throughput. And we are showing you what type of uh, modulations will you be able to get to on the DOCSIS 3.1 side. So DOCSIS 3.1, again, it's very dependent on the modulation profiles. So we're just showing you what kind of modulation profiles will you be able to get with each one of those CNRs to get you the feeling on what is the value here. Now, as we move forward and we get in to shorter distances between the head end and the, and the node. The last candlestick over here is distributed access architecture, uh, meaning remote Phi or remote Mac and Phi. In that case, of course, you get the best CNR because your node is, and your Mac Phi is actually closer to your subscriber. So yes, you do get the best uh, signal to noise ratio eventually for the subscriber. However, if you look at the benefits, say compare the last group of candlesticks over here to the one that is distributed access architecture. And of course, it does depend on the number of lambdas that you have on that specific fiber. But you can see that the benefit, the actual delta on the throughput is about, could be zero to 8%. So that means if you look at it just from the, just from the perspective of the signal to noise ratio, there's a very slight improvement in terms of how much more are you getting just by moving from 15 kilometer topology to a distributed access architecture. Now that shows you that there are the cases in which you are you know, more favorable uh, in choosing distributed access architecture, you'll have to take a look at your, your own topology. We can't tell you right now, just go all the way to distributed access architecture, just do remote phi no matter what, because it will not be the right answer for you, right? If you do have 15 kilometer cases, if this is the majority of your network, not sure if that's going to be the right thing for you, and it may, may not be the right thing for you because it will you know, cause you some operational complexity, some, you know, investment, uh, some investment that may not be needed and may not provide you the value that you want. However, it does have some other values by allowing you to additionally grow that bandwidth, possibly also using full duplex doxes. And this is what we're going to talk about in the next few slides. So again, just to emphasize, there are very big deltas between if you have a, a very uh, dispersed kind of topology, you know, very small rural uh, hubs and that are very distant from the head end, that would be that case over here, in which case you can get 20-30% of improvement if you go to distributed access architectures. And those would be the more natural candidates for, uh, re for remote Mac and Phi and for remote Phi architecture. But if you do have those shorter distances, then we need to look at it more carefully and make a decision on a case-by-case -case basis. So let's talk about full duplex doxes. What can it do for us in terms of uh, improving our throughput? So full duplex doxes is the newest thing that is being discussed by the cable labs in so cable labs uh, committees and also other uh, types of committees in the US. Uh, that are trying to lay the groundwork for the Cable Labs official committee. And Eris is very much active uh, along with other operator, uh, under other vendors, of course, and all the other operators uh, in trying to define the goals and the technologies that are going to serve us when we go to this full duplex uh, type of architecture. The full duplex goal is to allow to use higher bandwidth on the upstream direction, as I mentioned earlier by using the existing HFC infrastructure. So we do have this gap, if you remember a few slides earlier, that I showed that the 10 gig EPON can do 10 gig up, but we cannot do that today on the current access architecture. So this is what full duplex docs is, is targeted at mitigating and trying to improve the upstream band, bandwidth and upstream speed using the existing HFC um, architecture. 
So full duplex doxis, if we look at it in terms of the final goal and the main, uh, you know, the main uh, ideal picture of that, that would be the center, um, that would be the, the center, uh, sorry, graph over here. That means that we're taking a full chunk of spectrum and we'll be able to transmit both upstream and downstream signals from that, uh, on that entire spectrum, which sounds amazing, right? Sounds like a dream, an ideal dream of, you know, being able to transmit everything all together, everybody's gonna live together in harmony. Probably not the case though. This is the end goal, but this is the not realistic goal for tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. So if we look at it in a more realistic way, in the first phases of full duplex doxis, we wanna look at this chunk of data, which is going to be between 100 and 700 megs of, uh, of spectrum. And we wanna be able to do full duplex doxis on that area, but to some extent, because of some problems and issues and um, that I'm going to talk about in the next couple of slides, we may not be able to transmit everybody all together in this entire band, but we may want to do that in some chunks of bandwidth. So that means that we may want to do upstream in certain areas of that bandwidth uh, at certain time and downstream on a certain time on that area of spectrum for a specific transmission group, for a specific group of modems. And maybe another group of modems will be able to transmit their upstream in the area of that group's downstream and vice versa. So we will be able to transmit simultaneously both upstream and downstream on the same areas of the spectrum, but we're trying to look at it uh, in terms of different transmission groups, different, different groups of modems that will not be interfering with one another. Let me show you what I mean by that. So this is the biggest problem uh, that full duplex doxis need to tackle when we're going into the spec definition phases of the full duplex doxis. The biggest problem is that we have noisy modems. And noisy modems are those that are creating a lot of noise on the plant for a specific leg on the RF plant. So we have a fiber node over here. We have all those taps on the way. And we have a group of modems inside multiple homes that are all connected <coughs> to the same leg of uh, the same RF leg of that uh, fiber node. And, sorry, would that be better if I just drop the microphone? Because it's... Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Sure. Yep. Just stay here. Okay. All right. I'm going to stop walking then. Um, all right. So, what we're talking about here is the biggest problem again on the full duplex that we're trying to solve. And when we look at it this way, we have this very noisy modem that is transmitting on the upstream direction in a very high power. And that one, this guy over here is transmitting with 32.8 dBmV, which causing the other modems uh, pretty big impairments. So his neighbor over here in the neighborhood is actually seeing such big noise that it's unable to get anything. It's unable to get anything on the downstream and on the upstream because again, they're using the same spectrum. So it's not able to get any pilots, it's not even, probably not even able to register because of this tremendous noise. Now the noise is reduced as we go closer to the, uh, to the fiber node. So those other modems are still alive. Yes, they can still operate, but they're not able to use those higher modulations because of this uh, cable modems uh, level of noise. Now, this cable modem is also you know, not without a problem because he's transmitting such, in such high power in the upstream direction that he's probably not hearing anything on the downstream direction. So in order to solve this problem, what we need to do is to, first of all, allow this cable modem, this noisy cable modem, to, self -can to, to do self-echo cancellation, meaning reduce the power that it is transmitting on the upstream direction from the entire uh, you know, signal itself. So it will be able to extract the downstream signal. And uh, so this is one type of algorithm that we need to implement. And the other algorithm is going to be able to have this cable modem over here somehow find a way to you know, hear something on the network, meaning not use probably the same frequencies as a super noisy cable modem. So this is the problem that we're trying to solve, and there are multiple ways in which we can solve that. Now, not going to get into too many details on that because it's all very new and it's not very well defined just yet. 
But the DOCSIS 3.0, the, the full duplex DOCSIS is very much relying on the DOCSIS 3.1 spec. So up to an extent that it is defined as an annex to the DOCSIS 3.1 spec. So that means that if you would like to use the full duplex DOCSIS, you will want to deploy DOCSIS 3.1 first and we'll be able to, to materialize all the benefits of full duplex DOCSIS. Um, the different types of problems are being defined, you know, are, we're trying to find solutions for them right now in the full duplex committee. And what we're calling them are blinding effects, which means that this cable modem that I showed earlier is causing blinding effects for the rest of the cable modems on the same plan. So possible ways to do that is to distribute the groups of modems to transmission groups such that different transmission groups uh, will not be interfering to one another and the modems inside one transmission group will be only the modems that can transmit on the same frequency without hurting each other's performance. So this is one type of solution. Another type of solution would be to distribute again, as I said earlier, distribute the spectrum between who can transmit when on the downstream and on the upstream direction. So there are two types of algorithms or innovations that we are including in this um, in this spec, and one is going to be this, something that we call the sounding algorithm, the way to measure the RF performance, RF power levels, and to echo, do some echo cancellation and self-cancellation of signals on the RF plan. That's one type of innovation. The other type of innovation is do more sophisticated scheduling so that we'll be able to create those transmission groups, or they're called interference groups, such in, in such an effective way so that those transmission groups will be allocated different areas of the spectrum will not be interfering with one another. So these are the two types of innovations that we're looking at when we talk about full duplex DOCSIS. And as mentioned, this is still pretty much at its inception and it's going to grow more and more uh, mature over the next year or so. And we're going to start seeing some you know, more demos and more, um, uh, say, first versions of products in the next uh, year or two. All right, so let's talk about extended spectrum DOCSIS. So when we talk about DOCSIS 3.1, we're talking about up to 1.2 gig of, uh, of spectrum, right? We can also go to 1.7, 1.8 of spectrum on the DOCSIS, part of the DOCSIS 3.1 spec is an optional uh, feature. But we are looking into additional areas of the spectrum beyond that to be able to get even, even more uh, bandwidth out of the existing plant, with, again, without moving to pawn without ripping out any cables, without doing significant changes in the uh, existing network. So let's take a look at what does extended spectrum uh, DOCSIS mean. So pretty much it means what it says, right? It's not very, <laughs> not, uh, not very sophisticated in terms of name. It just tells you that we're looking into having a downstream transmission beyond 1.8 uh, uh, gig on the spectrum. So we're looking into uh, get, getting to six gigahertz of uh, transmission on the first phases, maybe later on going to 10 gig, going to 25 gig uh, of uh, gigahertz on the spectrum itself to be able to provide that, uh, that additional bandwidth. Now, how do we come up with that? Actually, we just copied from the telcos. We looked at what the telcos can do with their existing twisted pairs and how are they able to grow their bandwidth and grow their offering based on existing infrastructure over the last few years. And we saw that by doing extended spectrum on the telco, on the DSL networks, they were able to get 700 times more than what they started with, with twisted pairs 20, 21 years ago or so. So we looked at that, we're looking into ways to doing that. And if we take whatever these guys did and we copy that to our domain of, uh, of, of, of life, we can say that what they did is to use higher areas of the spectrum, you know, modulate the exact same signals, putting them just higher in the, in the spectrum. And what they did is to stretch the fiber as close to the home as possible. Okay, that sounds familiar, right? We're talking about that anyway. So if we're talking about moving to, you know, fiber to the premises, even, even to the tap, but later, later on to the home or to the premises, then this is exactly the step that will enable us to use extended spectrum DOCSIS. 
I put a link here, you're going to get this presentation afterwards. This is a link to a YouTube presentation of a demo we did uh, about a year ago for extended spectrum DOCSIS, showing what we can get to with 6 gigahertz on the, um, on the spectrum. So I, I do recommend watching that afterwards if you're interested. So why does extended spectrum DOCSIS make sense? Why, why should you even look at that? Well, obviously it provides you with more bandwidth, duh. Okay, we got that. But the big benefit of that is actually the fact that you are able to get more and more out of your existing HFC network without changing your head-end equipment, without changing you know, CPE, without changing much, much on the HFC side, we will be adding modulators to go higher on the on the spectrum. We will be using some demodulators in the end to bring that back into the original uh, to the original frequency band. But eventually, if you look at those CPEs that you have inside the homes and you have those transmission devices inside the head ends, no matter what they are, you will be able to keep using those, which is a huge saving. It's a huge. Um, it's a huge saving on, you know, on, on your investment for replacing those, upgrading those, learning everything from scratch. So this is just, again, extending the ability of using whatever you've been using all along. So we believe that you can use DOCSIS 3.1 with extended DOCSIS spectrum and use uh, other solutions such as really deep fiber, which we're going to talk about next. And what you also need to do is use something we call OBI free solution. Why do you need to do that? If we look at this drawing over here, you can see that, okay, we have a fiber node because we're going very deep, right? It's going to be a fiber node in the tap, probably. Um, it's going to go fiber all the way pretty much to, uh, to the tap. Going to go to the homes in this upper picture over here, possibly to six gigahertz uh, spectrum, going to all those homes over here. Or you can use RFOG technology to bring the actual fiber to the home itself. But then you do have a problem on the upstream direction when you're using this fiber technology uh, from those multiple home groups because you will have OBI, you, have, you will have some contention between the fiber uh, transmissions on the upstream direction. So this is why you need to find an OBI free solution uh, that will uh, enable you to cancel out the noises from different uh, fiber upstream transmissions and you'll be able to efficiently use that on the fiber direction on the upstream, on the upstream as well. And another important point is that it can be used along with full duplex DOCSIS. So you will be able to you know, increase the bandwidth on the downstream on this extended spectrum, but you will be also make sure that you want to invest in your upstream bandwidth. That's going to be done by using full duplex DOCSIS as well. All right, so we do see that going deep on the fiber is solving us a lot of problems in very various domains. So let's take a look at how do we actually do that for those uh, customers that we want to do it for. So the question is, okay, we understand we want to go fiber deep, you know, to some extent, but how much and when, and uh, how do we actually do the migration from existing HFC network today to uh, this fiber to the home end goal, right? And there are a lot of stops on the way. So. Let's, let's take a look at it in terms of migration steps. And there are multiple migration steps. Every step of the way is a possible stop that you can stay on for as, as, as long as you want to. But let's take a look at a few, uh, a few possible paths. So this chart over here shows you the different types of access technology, starting from integrated CCAP on the bottom here, going to distributed access architecture and going all the way to PON at the top, which is, you know, fiber to the home is uh, eventually the, the assumed to be the goal here. On the bottom, on the axis, you will see the type of uh, fiber depth that you're going. And if we're looking at it, we want to migrate to fiber to the home, then the axes are advancing in a way that will get us closer with fiber to the home. So we have node plus four, node plus three, two, one, zero, etc. And node plus zero is an important point, which is uh, the fiber deep architecture or fiber to the last amplifier. And this is going to be the one that, you know, we're talking with a lot of customers about. All right. So these are the different types of architectures. Let's add the bandwidth that we believe we can get to with those. So on those areas over here, when we talk about node plus four up to node plus one, we can get to one to ten gig of, um, of throughput, but if we go to fiber uh, to the last amplifier or fiber deep, 
we are opening up the extended spectrum doxis and we're able to get to higher uh, bandwidth on that area. We're able to, we don't have to, but this is opening up a bunch of options, right? So this is the extended spectrum bandwidth we can get to. This one um, is getting us higher if we get to fiber to the tap. So you can see as much as we go closer to the home with the fiber, our bandwidth um, that we are able to provide, again, using DOCSIS triggered one with extended spectrum is just growing. So, okay, so these are the all, these are all the options. Let's see how do we jump between those. So one option would be starting from say not plus four, let's just be optimistic and say that you have in the worst case not plus N plus four topology in your network today. And we know that for a lot of customers, the situation is much worse, right? We have customers with N plus 15 um, that still need to work through that. But let's assume we're starting from whatever N plus X that, you're, uh, that you have today. One possible option would be to grow gradually and just do node splits until you reach this N plus zero type of architecture. So N plus four to N plus three, N plus two, getting to fiber to the last amplifier or fiber to the fiber D, which would be pretty much the remote Phi architecture that we're discussing right now, or it could also be remote Mac and Phi because it puts, again, all your DOCSIS Phi capability in, uh, in an N plus zero type of, uh, type of architecture, no amplifiers, no active devices after the node itself. So that would be a possible stopping point, right? Can, you can stay there for a few years, or you can move to uh, fiber to the tap after that, right? You can take this exact node, not just put that in the last amplifier, but put that in the tap as well. So getting it a little bit closer even to the customer. And maybe a, a next jump after that would be to just move to, to pawn altogether. That will be easier to do because when you get to a point where you have your service groups already split it to an extent that this makes sense, you're actually getting closer and closer to the size of the service group that is you know, relevant and effective for pawn deployments. So we're actually using HFC architecture tricks and innovations to get you closer and closer to pawn deployment and fiber to the home eventually. So that would be a possible stopping point. Another type of stopping point, another type of path would possibly be, again, the remote Phi or remote uh, Mac and Phi path. Now, if we start from, again, node plus four with this kind of uh, bluish uh, jump, you can just move directly from not node plus four to N plus zero, meaning taking your current existing integrated CCAP architecture, move that to remote Phi architecture. Use the CCAP as the Mac core, and deploy new nodes with remote Phi devices inside them, RPDs as we call them. And then you are already at N plus zero type of architecture, which enables you to, again, get the digital signals on those fibers in a much more effective way, enables you to use full duplex doxis later on, all those goodies that I mentioned earlier. Now, from that point, we can also move and have those nodes replaced by remote, uh, by remote OLT nodes, right? If you wanted to go fiber to the home, right now, if, you, if we look at this FTTLA over here, you're actually sending HFC to the home, sorry, HFC to the home from the node itself. So from the node, you're sending HFC back to the home, still using the exact same cable modems, exact same CP equipment. But if you want to move to fiber to the home, replace those uh, equipments in the, in the home itself that will be getting now fiber, then you will be looking into moving to a remote OLT kind of architecture, whereas you will still have those uh, signals transmitted from the head end over here, and you will be sending them down the line to a remote OLT node itself. This will be the equivalent distributed architecture for the PON world. So you can go either way, both of them will work, both of them will provide you with, uh, with a, lot of, you know, a lot of benefits and the additional throughput, and additional bandwidth that you require to meet your customer uh, demands. So the question is, okay, what I showed you looks great, right? Let's just go through it all the way, let's just do PON today, right? No, we can't, we don't have enough money. Now, the question is, what do we do if we don't have enough money? And of course, none of us actually does have enough money ever. Um, the question is, if you have that 
small amount of money or allocated amount of money that you have on a per year basis, how do you make a decision on the migration of, of your network? Where do you put your money in the best way? Where do you put your money in a way that will provide you the best benefit uh, and the upgrade to the network that will allow all your customers to benefit from those upgrades and maybe not just a few of them? So the answer is that these additional upgrades and going fiber deep is very expensive, as you probably know. Fiber deep is, um, is expensive mostly because of the last mile and that problem, um, even the last 100 meters uh, is, is being considered as the hardest part. And the reason is because you have to dig all those beautiful gardens of your customers and you have to dig out all of those and pay the subscriber, you know, pay your subscribers some compensation for that. So what we would like to do is try to avoid that as much as we can, whereas we want to dig the streets in areas where we can, and we want to be able to do that very selectively. Our studies show that going from N plus zero to fiber to the home is actually doubling the cost of the upgrade. So meaning if you go just to N plus zero, that would be, I think it says uh, $30,000 over here for the upgrade itself, if we're considering you know, a bunch of um, other additional costs around it. But if you go fiber to the home, it's, 60, it's closer to $60,000 which is doubling it. So just this 100 meters on the last part is going to be the most difficult part. We'd like to avoid that if we can for as long as we can. So the answer is, okay, let's just do that very selectively. Let's take only the customers that are driving the biggest T maxes for us, the, those that are requiring the higher bandwidth, the, the top service tiers that we need to serve. And we take those customers very selectively and move them to those new technologies, move them to fiber to the home or fiber to the tap type of technology that provides us with two benefits. First of all, they will get what they need, right? They will get the higher bandwidth, the higher throughput that they actually need for their service today. And the second thing is that it will free up the bandwidth on the traditional HFC network so that all the other subscribers that were not digging their beautiful gardens will be able to make use of that feed up space and grow their service tiers as well. So how do we do that? If we look at it, if we look at, the, at this diagram over here, the CCAP that we have today is feeding a group of homes. And we have a couple of, say, homes here that are the top requiring, the top demanding customers, uh, so to speak. If we take those two homes and we move them to a different fiber, first of all, we free up this home's fiber to you know, support a much smaller group, group of subscribers, basically a node split, right? Uh, but we are also getting fiber to those two very high demanding homes in a way that will you know, allow them to keep growing their bandwidth and we're doing it only for two homes, not for, say, those, all those five homes over here. So we you know, very carefully pick those subscribers, move them to fiber. We're able to, to split the original fiber in that point over here. And we're able to send the fiber just to those two homes, maybe use, again, Doxy Street at one, extended spectrum, use full duplex for those, whereas the others, maybe we don't need to touch them for a long time because we freed up the network on those legacy HFC homes and to an extent that they can keep using whatever they got for many, many years more. So this is the architecture that we would recommend. This is the strategy that we would recommend you look at by, you know, as a way of migration between, you know, not just doing it all at once, by doing a gradual investment and freeing up legacy network, whereas my, at the same time migrating the higher, uh, the higher speed tiers to those uh, new types of architecture, fiber to the tap and fiber to the home. Now, the question is that you guys probably asking yourself, okay, this is all very nice, but what is right for me? What is right for my company? What is right for my topology? And the answer is, I don't know, you, you tell me. The question will depend on your average, uh, on your average bandwidth requirement, on your T average, it will require, it will depend on your T max. It will depend on the access topology, right? Remember the length of the fibers were very crucial to say what type of architecture is beneficial for which customer. And it will also depend on how much money are you willing to invest at what point in time, right? If you would like to invest, say, X 
X amount of dollars at this year, X amount of dollars this next year, then that will, you know, different differ the type of solution that we would recommend you do, right? The type of investment that is attached to each one of those steps that I mentioned is very is very different. So it really depends on how much money will you likely be, you know, investing in each point in time. What we can say without, you know, getting into a specific case of a customer is that we do recommend that you look at fiber to the last amplifier as a possible stopping point. And we showed this path that uh, this, this jump, jump uh, chart that I showed earlier, fiber to the last amplifier or N plus zero fiber deep type of architecture seems to be a pretty good sweet point, sweet point that will allow you to stay in and you will be able to materialize the benefits of DOCSIS 3.1, distributed access architecture, and full duplex DOCSIS. So that would be a possible good point in which you can stay in, whereas the investment to get to that point is not that big as it would be to get all the way with fiber to the home. Another general recommendation we can make wholeheartedly is that you will take a look at this selective customer migration. Handpick the customers that you would like to move to fiber, uh, to fiber to the premises or fiber to the tap kind of architecture. And migrating just those selected customers will provide you with greatest benefit without changing much on the majority of your plan for all those, say, normal or average type of subscribers. This type of uh, migration scenario, this type of migration strategy will also allow you to capitalize on all your existing network, meaning all your existing CMTS and CCAP equipment will keep being useful for you if you use this type of uh, migration strategy. And you don't have to make revolutionary changes in your network if you take a look at this migration, uh, migration path that is pretty gradual. And in addition, this fiber to the less amplifier um, that I mentioned is a good it's a good spot because it is going to provide you again with this higher bandwidth on those fibers because going from analog to f analog to uh, digital on those existing fibers using DOCSIS 3.1 and all its benefits, using full duplex DOCSIS, and later on using the extended DOCSIS spectrum that uh, that I covered uh, as well. So using all those in combination will allow you to get much more of your existing HFC infrastructure and will allow you to provide those high bandwidths that you need to to your subscribers inside the homes. So that is it from my side. Um, I'll be glad to answer any questions. Thank you, sir.